Hello and welcome to the Prudent Woman Retreat 2023. My name is Lisa Ann Spencer and this is actually my second year of being a presenter at the Prudent Woman Retreat and I'm very glad to be back and I'd like to take a moment to say welcome to those who are returning from previous year's retreats and welcome to those of you who are new. I'm sure you're going to benefit greatly from the women who are presenting in this year's retreat. So the theme of this year's retreat, as you well know, is rest. Um, so that's what we're going to be focusing on today. And you're going to be hearing from a lot of different women coming from a lot of different perspectives. So my perspective is going to be quite different, I do believe, um, because I teach the Bible from a doctrinal and a dispensational point of view. And normally what you get is life application. And I've got nothing against life application. I think it's wonderful. And I also think that it is prudent to do life application from the scriptures to our own lives. However, I believe it is more important for us to understand the passages doctrinally first before we apply them to our lives because there are clearly some things in scripture that just do not apply to us today in this dispensation that we live in. So we're going to talk about that. Well, one of the things that I'm going to do, because as a teacher, my goal is for you to be able to study the Bible for yourself. You should not feel like you have to tune in to someone in order to be able to understand your Bible. Yes, we all need helps. I've received a lot of help in my life, and I appreciate that. But anybody can give you wrong information, and the only way for you to know that you have the correct information is for you to get it directly from the Bible yourself. So I'm going to use the theme of this year's retreat, Rest, to show you how I personally study the Bible so that I can find out everything that God's Word says on a topic and not go to the Bible with my own preconceived ideas of what a word means, in this case, rest. So you'll see behind me here, I have this giant book. Some of you may have this. This is Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, and it's about eight pounds maybe, and um, it's a wonderful resource. I received my first copy of Strong's when I was 25 years old for my 25th birthday. I was just thrilled to have it. It has every word found in the King James Bible. It has um, a brief um, verse where it's found, and it tells you whether it's from the um, Hebrew or Aramaic or Greek and what the root word is. It's a wonderful tool to have, but it's very cumbersome. It's huge. It has limits in its applications because you can't take it with you everywhere you go. But most of you, I'm sure, are already aware of all the free um, apps that are available on your phones. Um, where you can download this concordance, Strong's, or many others like it. I personally use uh, BibleGateway.com and BlueLetterBible.org. I'm just used to those. Um, I like them. They serve my needs. There are others out there, and if you have one that you like to use already, you're familiar with, by all means, continue to use it. But one of the first things that I do when I am studying something in Scripture topically, like rest, um, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go type that word into my Bible app and see how many results I get. So in this case, when I typed in rest, I got over 300 results. And part of the reason for that is, depending on which app you use, <clears throat> if you put in the word rest, you may get hits to such things as um, restrained, restore, and restitution. Those words are going to pop up in your search if you're using um, Bible Gateway, for example, 
or when you use Blue Letter Bible, if you use the wild card, the asterisk. Like if you type in REST with an asterisk, it's going to give you all forms of the word rest. Either way, you come up with 275 plus results, and that's a lot of results. So if you have the time, and I encourage you to do it when you do have the time, read through every verse that uses the word rest. This is the only way that you and I can know um, how God uses the word, um, the context in which he uses it, and this is the only way we're going to get a complete um, usage of the Word of God biblically. All right, so I did that, and um, one of the um, tools that I use, a study method, and it's even called a hermeneutic, uh, a rule of Bible study, is the law of first mention. So when I look up rest, I really pay attention to where it's first used because very often it will be defined for us in that verse. And I also like to go to the book of Job because it's the oldest book in the Bible and it's also the oldest book in the world. All right, so when I put in rest, let's just go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 2. I hope you have your Bibles and maybe even a notebook to write these things down. And also, as part of the Prudent Woman Retreat, you should have gotten some printouts. And so you will have an outline for my session, and you will also have some additional references and homework. So I hope that you've taken the time to print those out. If you haven't, be sure to do so afterward. All right, Genesis chapter 2 and verse 2, and I will just read this for us. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. So what we see in the context of this verse is that it says he ended his work. So to rest has something to do with the work being complete according to the first time it's used in Scripture. So let's just pop over to the next reference, which is Genesis chapter 8, since we're right here. Genesis 8, 4. And it says, The ark rested in the seventh month on the seventeenth day of the month upon the mountains of Ararat. So you're familiar with this. And when you read this, you may think, well, the ark landed like a ship landed on the shore. Um, But if we keep in mind what we just learned from the previous verse, is it that the ark ended its work? Well, you might say no, but in one way that is true because the ark was built for a purpose. It did its job, and now the job is ended, and it rested on the mountains of Ararat. Just something for you to think about there. Okay, and um, one of the things that I did when I came to this verse because it said that the ark rested in... I took my Blue Letter Bible, typed in rested in, just to see what kind of results I would get. So you might like to do that too, to do some comparisons. All right, so why would I be so careful um, of each word in the Bible? And why would I encourage you to do that? And I do that because God himself says in his word that he is particular about every word of God. So in your notes, you're going to find some extra references that I would encourage you to look up and see for yourself that every word of, the God, of God in the Bible does matter. And he warns us also Do not remove from the words. Do not add to the words. And then he also says, do not rest or twist or take them out of context. So as we're studying, we want to be careful and we want to be obedient to what the Word of God says. Okay, also the word rest 
lots of those references have to do with what we would call the remainder. And let's just pop over to Genesis 30 and let me show you this real quick. I'm sure you know what I mean when I say the remainder. Genesis 30, 36, it says, and he, and that's Laban, set three days journey betwixt himself and Jacob, and Jacob fed the rest of Laban's flocks. Very common usage of the word the rest of, meaning the remainder, what was left of the flocks, uh, Jacob fed. Okay, easy to understand, and you can get rid of all of those references where it means remainder, because that's not what we're talking about here today with the Prudent Woman Retreat and the theme of rest. All right, but one thing to be careful of is even though there's nearly a hundred of those type of references, there's one where there's an exception. And I want to read that one to you also. Let's turn to Exodus chapter 16. So Genesis, Exodus chapter 16 and verse 23. And he said unto them, and this is Moses speaking to the children of Israel, this is that which the Lord hath said, Tomorrow is the rest of the holy Sabbath unto the Lord. Bake that which ye will bake today, and seethe that ye will seethe, and that which remaineth overlay up for you to be kept until the morning. So he's giving them instructions about the very first Sabbath day that the nation of Israel is keeping. Um, so this is an important part of this retreat definition of the word rest because God defines the word for us. And the nation of Israel has a rest and it is part of the covenant um, that God made with the children of Israel. So it's very important for us to understand that that particular rest that is found throughout the scripture doesn't really have anything to do with Christians today. And I will show you that from scripture, how that there is a distinction between Israel's rest and the rest for the body of Christ. So um, one of the things that I've given you in your homework assignment is for you to take the word Sabbath, um, Put it into your concordance. Write down how many times it's found, what books it's found in. Read through those. See who is speaking and to whom are they speaking so that you can learn everything that the Bible says about Sabbath. Not going to the Bible with your preconceived ideas of what the Sabbath is, but let the Bible and let God define the word for you. That would be a very good exercise for anyone to do, and you'll learn a great deal about the covenant that God had with Israel. Okay, so we'll get to that distinction in the rest toward the end of this lesson. So for right now, I want to do a real quick overview for those people who may be new to the Bible, um, new, uh, new Christians that don't know a lot about the history of the Bible. If you don't know these things, then you might feel lost that you don't understand what's going on. So let me just give you a quick overview. And I'm actually just going to read from my notes so that I can do it quickly. After the flood came the Tower of Babel, and that is where God gave up on the nations of the world. He chose one man out of all the men on the face of the earth. His name was Abram, later changed to Abraham. He said to Abraham, I'm going to make of you one great nation. I'm going to give you a promised land, and your name will be great. Okay, so Abraham had a son named Isaac. Isaac had a set of twin sons named Esau and Jacob. God gave the same promise to Jacob. He chose him. He said, I'm going to give you the promises, this promised land, and basically this promised rest. 
Jacob's name is changed to Israel. That's where the name for the nation of Israel comes from. The man Jacob had 12 sons. These are the 12 tribes of Israel. One of the tribes is Levi, from which Moses comes, and he is the lawgiver, giving the law to the nation of Israel and making that covenant agreement with that particular people. They became a nation when they came out of Egypt. And in your notes, you're going to see some references for you to check to make sure that that is the truth. All right. God promised a king and a kingdom and a city um, to that people. And he did that through the tribe of Judah. And that's David. And that brings us all the way to Christ. One of the things that we know is that that rest has not been entered yet because Jesus Christ has not ascended to the throne of David that sits upon the earth in the city of Jerusalem. That's in the prophecy regarding Israel, and it is something that will be fulfilled in the future. It's very helpful for you to understand your Bible if you just understand that brief history of Israel. Okay, so that is called Israel's time of rest. You can also read about that in the book of Hebrews, which, by the way, is written to the people who are known as the Hebrews. It's not written to the church, the body of Christ. So again, that shows the distinction of who those promises and that promise rest is for. All right, so, so the promises of rest are not made to us as Gentiles, but we don't have to be jealous because we have promises of our own. Our promises have to do with inheriting heavenly places, taking the place actually of the fallen angels um, that fell during Lucifer's rebellion. That's another lesson for another day. But today we are called the church, which is the body of Christ. You're going to have those references also in your notes. All right, so let me go on with the other definitions of rest. And the way we're going to do that is by considering the Apostle Paul's letters and what he has to say about rest. Why are we going to give this special consideration to Paul? There are several reasons. The first one is because he is the apostle that Jesus Christ sent to the Gentiles. That's us. Paul says he was the last person to see Jesus, and he was. Paul says he received abundant revelations from the risen Savior from heaven. He finished writing the New Testament. He wrote over half the New Testament. Paul says, I magnify my office. We should also magnify Paul's office. We should not diminish it. So this is why we're looking to him. Paul says in his letters that we should consider what he says so that the Lord can give us understanding in all things. And Paul also says that if any man thinks that he's spiritual, he needs to acknowledge that the things that Paul writes are the commandments of the Lord. Those are very important reasons for us to consider what he has to say. The first time Paul uses the word rest, he's speaking about the Jews. Let's go ahead and look at that. Romans chapter 2. We're in the New Testament now. Romans chapter 2, verse 17. Behold, thou art called a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. So we can see from the context of Paul's use of this word that when the word rest is used here, or the form is restus, um, and also I have included in your notes why the King James Bible uses the E-S-T and the E-T-H, as a suffix for the words, there's very specific and important reasons why um, the grammar is important in your Bible and should not be changed. Okay, so 
they are trusting in, they are boasting in, boasting in the law. So that's another definition of resting. It means trusting in. All right, I'm going to skip on down for sake of time. Um, let's go over to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 17. And I will read that to you. If I can find it. There it is. Am I in the right place? 13. I'm sorry. All right. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 13. I had no rest in my spirit because I found not Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went from thence into Macedonia. Okay, so we read he had no rest in his spirit. Now, go forward to chapter 7, chapter 7 and verse 5. And let me read this one. For when we were come into Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were troubled on every side. Without were fightings, within were fears. All right, so no rest in his spirit or in his flesh. And I, this is what I mean by life application. I could have focused on these passages given you the overview of the context and tell you what was it that Paul did to relieve himself of this lack of rest that he had in his spirit and in his flesh. But instead of me doing that, I'm going to encourage you to do that as part of your homework. Go read Acts chapter 16. Read First and Second Corinthians so that you can understand what was going on in Paul's life that he would be suffering so much. But I will point this out for you, that in both of those passages, he mentions, we see words like heaviness, sorrow, affliction, anguish of heart, tears, trouble, fighting, and fear. So Paul is experiencing these things, and this is something that we experience too in this world, and we will until either we're raptured away to be with the Lord forever or until we die. Trouble is just part of this life, but we know we can find rest, and it's found right here in God's Word. So I want to move ahead a couple of chapters, chapter 12, and look at this very important reference again by the Apostle Paul using the word rest in a different way. 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 9. And he said unto me, and this is God speaking to Paul, and if you have a red letter Bible, which is kind of funny, these words are going to be in red. Do you know that the whole Bible ought to be in red? Because it is all the words of God, not the words of men. Anyway, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. That's what God said. And Paul said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I tell you what, you know you're a mature Christian when you can look at trouble and anguish and fear and physical infirmity and spiritual hardship and you can glory in those because you know that it's then when the power of Christ, that saving grace of His, that strengthening that we get in the inner man, that is the all-sufficient grace of God. That's the rest that all of us need. All right, so I wrote in your notes to give you more information about this specific situation. Paul is actually asking God for a miracle of healing here, of infirmity in his flesh. God says no. So in your notes, there's a small study on 
where Paul used to be able to heal, but at the end of his life you see he is no longer able to heal himself or others. Healing has ceased because God's grace is sufficient. Okay? All right, his last reference to rest, and here's where we're going to get into the distinctions between the rest. All right, let's go to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I will read verse 7 very quickly. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. I'm going to have to read the whole sentence for us to get the context. It begins in verse 3 and goes through verse 10. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. Seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you, and to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. That's a mouthful, but it's very important that you see what God is speaking of is a time in Israel's history that has been prophesied in all the Old Testament where God is going to pour out his wrath on unbelieving Israel and on the unbelieving Gentile world. In your scripture, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble, the 70th week of Daniel, and the great tribulation. All those references you will find in your outline, and I hope that you will look those up for yourself. The passage says that when the Lord is revealed from heaven with his angels and flaming fire taking vengeance, that's that great tribulation period, the seven-year period. Um, the members of the body of Christ are going to be at rest. We're not going to be enduring that. And then what we need to understand also is that Israel cannot enter their rest until after the seven-year tribulation period. All right, so again, in your outline, you're going to find all the references about the body of Christ inheriting heavenly places, whereas Israel, the nation, is promised the earth. They're promised a city. Jerusalem. They're promised a kingdom and land in the Middle East. It's a very literal promises. We should believe every word of God. So when you see that, that Israel must endure this fiery trial, the body of Christ is going to be at rest with the Lord in heaven during that terrible tribulation period. That is very assuring to have an understanding of this rest, to see in the scripture for yourself that there's two different rest in two different locations, heaven and earth, and for two different people. All right, in closing, we can approach the scriptures with a lot of ideas in our mind that are frankly wrong about the meaning of words. When we go to God's Word, we need to pay particular attention to every word of God. Let Him, let His Word interpret the Bible for us and teach us the true meaning 
of those words. And as much as we would like to focus on having rest in our spirit, rest in our physical bodies while we're here on earth, it's much more encouraging to think about the eternal rest that we experience. Because whatever rest we're experiencing here while we're on earth, it is temporary. It's as temporary as the trouble is temporary. But there is a promised day of rest coming for us as well. We call that the rapture, when we will be caught up to be with the Lord and live with Him forever. And that is very encouraging. In the meanwhile, we need to let the power of God rest on us. Let His grace be sufficient for us. I thank you for your time and attention. Um, I hope the study has been helpful to you, and I hope that you'll reach out to me after the retreat. You can find me on YouTube at Lisa Ann Spencer, and also on Facebook by my same name, Lisa Ann Spencer, and I have a blog where you can find many Bible studies called the Women's Weekly Bible Challenge, and you can find that at Women's Weekly Bible Challenge blogspot.com. I thank you and I hope you enjoy the rest of the retreat.